and good morning. Is my mic on this time? It is, good. All right, well, we missed you all last week. It's good to be back. We were on vacation, so how's that? Is that better? So it's good to see you all. So we're going to be preaching today from the book of 2 Kings. This is supposed to be for the preaching class, but I adapted it for you all this morning. We'll see how that goes. So book of 2 Kings, if y'all want to turn there, we'll get started. We're going to be in chapter 6. And I titled the sermon, Help for Hapless Man. You see that in your bulletin. I regret that title now, but I regretted it after I had sent it off to Christy. And once she prints the bulletins, they become immutable. You, know, you, can't, you can't change them. I'm sure I could have, but I didn't want to trouble her. So we're going to adjust that title for the sermon a little bit later, and I'll explain why. Um, but you can write it down now for those of you taking notes. Help for hapless man. So in the book of 2 Kings, there's a man, Elisha, and he begins some of his ministry with a great cry, and he cries out, where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? It's a cry of sorrow and of distress. The context of that is, Elijah, the mighty prophet of God, was the bright and shining light in what you could call possibly the dark ages of Israel. King Ahab was reigning with Jezebel, and they plummeted Israel into further rank idolatry. There is war. There is a a severe famine. It was a very trying time. It was a very difficult time, and it seemed that the only hope for Israel was the Lord's power working through Elijah, and Elisha was the servant of Elijah. And by the second chapter of the book of 2 Kings, Elijah is taken into heaven by way of a whirlwind, and he is no more to be on the earth. And so we're left with Elisha holding his mantle and crying out, where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? He's clearly distressed. The burden of leadership, of being the prophet of God, has now fallen upon him, and it is a cry for help. And I kind of imagined... We are on the banks of the Jordan there, and you hear Elisha cry that out, and he's upset, being confident in our counseling. We might saunter over there and, like, oh, I know the answer. I know where, I know where the Lord is. I know, I know the Psalms. Well, the Lord is in heaven, Elisha. Why are you upset? Elisha may fire back. Okay, what's he doing there? What doth he there? And he, oh, the same Psalm. Our God is in heavens. He does whatever he pleases. And Elisha he knows that. I think he would still might fire back. Well, what pleases the Lord? What is God pleased to do with men? And there's many answers to that. You can get the answer further and get more specific in the Psalms. And I'm going to argue today just one thing that pleases the Lord, and it'll imply other things, but it pleases the Lord to help men. God is pleased to help humankind in our fallen state, he delights in it. So we're going to go to 2 Kings chapter 6. This is our text. And we're going back about 3,000 years into the past. So is this going to be relatable? I have some help. Y'all know what this is? Who said it? They know their stuff. It's a stick. We're going to have that in, the, in this little passage, okay? So they had them back then. We still have them today. Does anyone know what this is? gets a little harder. It's an axe head. Look at that. The stick was easier to come by than the axe head, in case you were wondering. Those both make an appearance in this story. I brought those um, so we can have, make sure we know what we're talking about when we see what happens in the text. And it's amazing to me. I was excited. This is one of my favorite miracles in the Bible, that they had these 3,000 years ago, and we still have them today. <laughs> and I think there's a purpose to that. There's probably a reason why the Lord has chosen to do a miracle in such a way, and We'll we'll see if we can draw that out. But 2 Kings chapter 6, we'll start in verse 1. Now the sons of the prophets said to Elisha, See, the place where we dwell under your charge is too small for us. Let us go to the Jordan, and each of us get there a log, and let us make a place for us to dwell there. And he answered, Go. Then one of them said, Be pleased to go with your servants. And he answered, I will go. So he went with them, and when they came to the Jordan, they cut down trees. 
But as one was felling a log, his axe head fell into the water, and he cried out, Alas, my master, it was borrowed. Then the man of God said, Where did it fall? When he showed him the place, he cut off a stick and threw it, he threw it in there and made the iron float. And he said, Take it up. So he reached out his hand and took it up. What a fun passage. Has everyone read that before? Have y'all seen that before? I kind of wonder, what do I do? What does that have to do with me? Um, I don't know if y'all have ever used an axe or cut down anything with an axe. Um, it's a frightful thing to imagine this flying off. This is the second time axe heads flying off the handle has been mentioned in the scriptures. It was actually given as an example of God's law that if a man should be wielding an axe and the axe head fly off and strikes a man so that he dies, the man will not incur any guilt because it was an accident. So it's kind of a fun thing that it makes an appearance here and no one was injured and that's a, that's a major blessing. And so let's see, what is the point? What does this have to do with us 3,000 years ago? Well, we'll draw out my first point and that is that man needs help. Man needs help. Man needs all kinds of help. So my, I renamed this first point several times, and I was stressed out, all because I picked a bad title. So I had misunderstood my usage of the word hapless. I considered that meaning man is, you know, he has trouble, bad things happen to him, he needs help, there's forces outside of his control that he is um, weak to and he can't do anything about it. But looking up the word to make sure I had it right, hapless is, originally means unlucky, without luck, um, hexed or vexed. It really has a sense that There's that force out there of chance and luck that there's nothing we can do about it. It just happens. And I've found myself very displeased with this word. Uh, Knowing what we know about the Lord and what we can discern from this very passage, that word should never exist. The idea of luck and chance and of fate should never exist whatsoever. And we're going to see that in this passage. So it shouldn't exist. The concept of being unlucky, and I thought about it because of this guy. I mean, he's felling a log, the axe head flies off. What, what, what we know is that all things happen according to God's sovereign decree. And we kind of understand that as like a baseline of Christianity. But what's amazing to think about is that the majority of the world, if that were to happen to them, they might say, oh, that was unlucky. Um, that happened by accident. Oh, what a, you know, I think I broke a mirror. Black cat crossed my path. I don't know. Something happened. I'm just having bad luck today. And we become, man would rather set themselves under the authority of some amorphous energy force that has amoral rules and laws to it, such as luck. They would trade the omniscient, omnipotent, almighty God, right, that rules and controls everything, and they would rather be subjected to just some amoral, strange force, right? Um, I found great fault with this because this is what I believe. I used to do many a thing that I thought would bring me good fortune and good luck, and now I find myself disturbed whenever I hear people wishing people good luck or, you know, this, it seems so trivial, but it kind of flies off as part of our culture, and we're very superstitious people. I think of Paul on the mountain in Athens. He says, I see you're all too superstitious. I want to get us a right understanding that nothing happens to man, whether it be good, bad, or random seeming that the Lord has a purpose behind it and that he is in control and he wants to bring about a help to man. So therefore, the title's called Help for Hapless Man. I'm gonna, I crossed mine out. So if you have your notes, cross it out. If we post the name, can you do a line through it? That'd be cool looking. So it's, the hapless man exists only in that he has rejected a sovereign God and will not go to God for help. I mean, this is a real, it seems silly, but in our day and age, people will do whatever they can to try to change their luck. And it seems so so pagan and so silly, but um, people really strive to make sure their luck is balanced. And there is no luck. Let me give you some verses to point that out. Proverbs 16.33, The lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision thereof is from the Lord. The lot was like a dice you would roll um, that the Jewish people used to to decide things basically like a roll of dice. The proverb's so clear. Man rolls the dice, God decides every falling of it, how it is going to land, okay? Another one, Matthew, he says, 
that are not two sparrows sold for a farthing, but not a single one of them doesn't fall to the ground without my Father's knowledge. God is fully aware of all things that are happening. Okay, so why, why bring that up? I think this passage is ultimately trying to convey to us that God is sovereign over every situation, and therefore God is fully able, sufficient to help man in every situation. Fully able to help man. So man is not a product of random chance. Man is not a product of evolutionary forces. Man is not a product or even thus a victim to um, some unsympathetic or unconscious force, okay? Man was sovereignly placed by God in various positions. And one of the positions God has placed man is in a position or a character or a nature of mutability. Okay, we, as created creatures of God, we are in a position where we are subject to change and we are subject to be affected by outside forces, by our very environment. God has decided to do that and to place us in such a condition where we age, where we suffer loss, we can lose things, in order so that he can manifest his character and his nature. And part of his divine attribute, one of his divine attributes is that of mercy. And through his mercy, he desires to help man. Man is meant to be a subject of help. We are to receive help, and we are also to render help and aid. We're kind of in a fun middle position where we can actually help one another. We can help even the lower creatures. We can help the environment. Um, but there's no help that we can offer to God. Him being immutable and unchanging needs no help or needs no correction. We grow in our understanding, and people help us do that. We grow in our body and in our strength, and we need help to do that. So God has made, and has made us in such a position that everything that we are or could be or what can be accomplished by us depends upon help. And I was thinking about help a little bit more, in depth, it's an interesting concept. We almost know to do this intuitively as children. We will, as children, we start to come up to someone who we know has a little bit more than us, more experience, more strength, more ability, and we'll ask them to open this. Can you help me with this? Can you help me with that? And I was starting the question, is that, is help a result of the fall? Is it because we're in a fallen world that help is even a concept or a virtue that needs to be practiced upon the earth? And so thinking about that, I, I came up with the answer, no. I don't think that help is something that is primarily in existence to counteract the negative effects of sin. And I'd like to point your bring your attention to Genesis chapters 1. When God made perfect Adam, placed him in the garden, he said that all that he had made was, was good, was very good. Adam being perfect, having no sin nature, sin not yet entering into our world and not into humanity, God felt it necessary that Adam should have a help meet for him. So God makes Adam a woman in order that she may help him. I thought it was very interesting. I never thought about it before, to be honest with you. And then thinking more about this idea of help and serving one another and the benefits thereof, I believe that it, it is necessary and it is a virtue and it is a manifestation of God's mercy which does not require sin to be in the world. So let me give you some more for instances. Adam can now help Eve in having children. Eve will likewise help Adam in the same. It is a mutual help towards one another. In order to have, where's my musicians? There they are. In order to have a band, an orchestra, a symphony, you're going to need help. You can't do every instrument yourself. I don't care how advanced maybe you get with your technology. You're going to need some help in order to put on a live show. Man will need help to build a city, uh, to have community, so it's interesting, I think help is something that we are going to enjoy without the negative effects. So there seems to be two types of modes of help. Help that is meant to build up, and then there's help that is meant to mitigate or relieve from the, the effects of the fall. So we have pre-fall help and post-fall help, and I didn't, I didn't dive into if we're going to be helping each other in the new heaven and the new earth, and glorified help. No idea. I didn't have time to go that far. But so post-fall help, a lot more is needed. Now man needs help just to stay alive. I think of what happened with the horrible event with that submarine, um, and it was lost. You know, 
before we knew that it was crushed or imploded, um, we had thought that they were trapped somewhere in the waters, right, running out of oxygen. They had three or, three or so days. Um, oxygen, see, our air, seems to be one of the most abundant things we have on the planet, and yet we are in such a dependent state that when we find ourselves without it, we need great help in order to get that to us. I mean, those people, there were so many people rushing in to help just to save these people's lives. And it was an encouragement, but sadly, um, man's help is limited and it failed, being also mutable creatures and limited. We need help sometimes just to maintain our food supply, our water, the most basic resources. We may find ourselves in need of great help in order just to have them. So we have post-fall help. Man needs help just to accomplish things and grow, to make great works of art. And man needs help just to stay alive. You may even need help to defend yourself. You may be attacked. People cry out for help. You may need um, help to be rescued, like those people in the boat. All kinds of help. And another special post-fall kind of help that man needs now, and this is perhaps our most essential, is man needs help in knowing God our very creator and whom we once walked the earth with, with Adam, in the times of Adam and Eve before the fall, we need great help in order just to, know, just to know God. And I went there to show that we're designed to be helped, we're designed to be subjects and agents of help, because we find that man, this seems so basic, you know, it seems kind of easy that we know that we need help, but man tends to reject help on certain basis, okay? Men will reject help from someone for whom they do not esteem well. Some men would rather struggle and suffer than receive help from perhaps an enemy. You see it in the movies. There's a guy, the bad guy's always about to fall off the cliff at the end, and the good guy always tries to help him, right? The bad guy would rather die than be helped by the good guy. Um, it, there's a shame in, in, in being helped, or even just there's a pride that men have. Um, maybe men have this more. We will not ask for directions. We're not stopping. We don't need help. We don't need help. And there's, nothing, there's nothing inherently wrong about asking for directions if you're a woman, but no, I'm just kidding. No, we, there's, a, there's an element of pride where we refuse help on a basis that it'll bring shame to us because we don't rightly understand that we, by design, are meant to help one another. And I want us to understand that. I want us to embrace the fact that we are to be helped by one another and we are to help one another. All right. Now, let's examine our verse. Let's go back to it. I really like this story for many reasons. One of the reasons is it all just seems so normal. I mean, we can relate to all that's going on here. They're dwelling together. They don't have a big enough house or dwelling place, whatever it is they want to build. Like, oh, we need more space. And we relate to that. So let's go. Um, let's go. We're going to build ourselves a bigger dwelling. They're in need of leadership. They need help. They want Elisha to go with them, give them guidance and, 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 and leadership, exercising their need for help. And while they're there, obviously we see the mishap. There's that word again, the word hap, which means luck in the English. That's the origin. There's a mishap, and the man loses his axe head. This is a regular, everyday event. There isn't anything special really about this sort of thing. It's just a construction site. This kind of thing happens all the time. Men lose their tools, something breaks, whatever may happen. It just seems like a normal, everyday life. This is why it's one of my favorite miracles. There's nothing extraordinary going on. The man isn't even named. He's not some great person. He's some random guy who lost his axe head. And, and he finds that he's in need of help. He recognized his need of help even before he got started with the work. It's a borrowed axe head, we know. He went to some other person, asked if he could borrow it, so he needed help to do his work. And after he loses his axe head, he can't even now fulfill God's commandment, which is love your neighbor as yourself. Be a good steward. Return the axe head. He's distressed about this very thing. He needs help to continue to work. What is he going to do without his axe head? He needs help to work. He needs help to love his neighbor. And I think the reason why this whole thing happened is, I'm going to assume here, go out on a limb, that he needs help to know God a little bit better, as we all need help. What does he need to know more about God? This goes into our, um, 
second point is God is pleased to help man. God is pleased to help man. And I want to just go back real quick and think more about Elisha's miracles. I don't know if you're familiar, so I'm going to lay some out. This kind of happens in the middle of Elisha's ministry. Okay, some years have gone by since he last cried out, where is the Lord, the God of Elijah, that call for help. And immediately after he says that, he strikes the Jordan and the Jordan parts. A great miracle, the same one Elijah performed to get on the other side. So God immediately answers and shows, I'm here, and I'm here to help, and I will rend the aid, just as he says he will. And then over the next several years, Elisha performs amazing miracles, great miracles. Just a, what, a chapter beforehand, in chapter 5, Naaman is called a great man. Naaman, the general of the Syrian army, who it's, it's, it's said of him that the Lord himself gave Naaman great victories over his enemies. This great man, Naaman, is miraculously cured of his leprosy. There's a great miracle there. The parting of the Jordan, a great miracle for the great man, Elisha. You have a life and death situation with the Shunammite woman. She has a son that she conceived miraculously, being barren. And then years go by and the son falls ill and dies. And then we have a resurrection miracle. A lot is at stake. These are heavy situations. Life is at stake. So Elisha has performed great miracles. He'll go on in the next chapter to take an entire army captive, striking them blind, and having angels with flaming swords and flaming chariots surrounding him. Serious situation, very dramatic scene. But in the middle of all that, you have this miracle. It's an everyday event. What is it? It's probably a Tuesday. And it's an unnamed guy who loses an axe head, which was common enough to give an example of it as a law. And God rends the natural order of things to display his wonder, to help one person. One person. So, second point was, God is pleased to help man. Who, what kind of man is God going to help? Well, if you got to chapter, if you went from chapter 2 all the way to 6, like, okay, well, he'll be there for a life or death situation. Um, when I really need him, it'll, he'll be there. When we're under threat, with that great and grand disease, he'll be there. But there's no need to trouble God and to call upon him with a day-to-day struggle, with a day-to-day need, a day-to-day difficulty. And I probably need to be someone of, of import before God's going to see me and to listen to me and bring me help. But that's not what we see. We see that God will help any kind of man. I think of when God looked upon the servant of Abraham, his Egyptian servant Hagar, whenever she fled after being ill-treated and the angel of the Lord spoke to her, she said, I know that he is a God who sees because he sees me. We know from just this one little event, brethren, that The Lord sees each individual person, whether you be of great status or have a great name to yourself, or if you're like me, just a regular construction worker. The Lord sees, and he is pleased to help. Second sub-point under that is God, we see, will help man in any situation, so long as man would seek the Lord. If we, were, if we find ourselves in a grand situation, we typically kind of default. I think if you think this way, if you're like me, like, oh, if things get really bad, I know I'm going to really pray hard then and I'm going to consider the Lord. That's worthy of his time. Um, if it's a great thing or a great issue in which we pray against, like the issue of abortion, it seems so impossible. It's so enrooted, ingrained in our culture that it cannot be toppled. Well, brethren, when we pray for such things, we honor the Lord knowing that he is mighty enough to change the outcome of such a grand thing. And it puts God in a proper place. It's appropriate to pray that way. But when you pray for these very little things, minor issues, I don't know how to complete this task at work. Um, I'm tired. I just need the energy to get through the day. You do something different. It's kind of the inverse. You magnify God again, and you put yourself in a proper position and realize that Jesus' words are true, that apart from him, you can do nothing. When you find yourself praying to Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth, 
you are declaring the truth of his character and of his nature, that he is omniscient, he knows all and he sees you, and he is all-powerful, and he is all-present. He's there and able to help you. And that you actually agree with his right assessment, that you are a needy, dependent creature in need of his help. And you glorify him with those things. The Lord, in fact, is actually displeased with man when they fail to seek him and when they fail to recognize their humbling position as being dependent, they actually offend God when they try to handle things on their own or they try to seek their own help. I'll give you an example. We have it in 2 Kings chapter 1. And this is kind of how this whole book starts. I think one of the major themes of it is a God that helps man. And, a, and if you look at chapter 1, we'll just read the first four verses. It kind of punctuates a major offense done to the Lord. After the death of Ahab, Moab rebelled against Israel. Now Ahaz fell through the lattice in his upper chamber in Samaria and lay sick. I like that too. I mean, there's a guy climbing the lattice. <laughs> I would do something like that so I can relate to this guy also. Don't be climbing the trees if you have kids and stuff, okay? You need to stop that. So now Ahaziah fell through the lattice in his upper chamber in Samaria and lay sick. So we sent messengers telling them, go inquire of Biel Zebub, the god of Ekron, whether I shall recover from this sickness. Man. See, again, man would rather be subject to something else other than God in their fallen state. I don't want that God who is omniscient and omnipotent. I don't want him. He's uncontrollable. He's not within my realm of influence. Or so it seems I'd rather have luck. Or I'd rather have a false god. Go and inquire of this god. But the angel of the Lord said to Elijah the Tishbite, Arise, go up, and meet the messengers of the king of Samaria, and say to them, Is it because there is no god in Israel that you are going to inquire of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron? Now therefore, thus says the Lord, You shall not come down from the bed to which you have gone up, but you shall surely die. And you just wonder, what if he just asked the Lord for help? Would the Lord, would the Lord save him? We saw that very thing happen with Hezekiah, stricken with the sickness, cries out to the Lord. And the word of the Lord came to him and said, you will die from this sickness. He cries to the Lord for help. Humbling position for a king to recognize his dependent position. And the Lord healed him and granted him many more years. What about, so there's an offense. We offend God by not seeking help. What about this other king? Second Chronicles 16, chapter 11. The acts of Asa from the first to last are written in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. In the 39th year of his reign, Asa was diseased in his feet, and his disease became severe. Yet even in his disease, he did not seek help from the Lord, but sought help from physicians. Man. I told my wife, oh, she's gone. When I was putting together this sermon, I was a little um, upset, I guess. I was concerned that I had developed this sermon for the class, and I didn't really try to touch on any need. I just picked the passage because I liked it, and I thought it would be fun and you know, to hash it out. And so I thought, this is pretty elementary to try to convey to the people of God that there's a God who helps and that we should seek him for help. So I kind of thought this was going to be pretty easy for everyone, I guess. And I thought I was doing you all a disservice, actually. Um, And I thought, thinking of this, I mean, this is incredible. This King Asa saw the mighty hand of God upon him early in his reign, where the Lord routed a one million man Ethiopian army and by God's mighty help, he saw a great victory in an awesome scenario, in a great and awesome scenario. And yet, in the end of his life, a disease, very common thing, normal stuff, this isn't isn't a very big, it's only in his feet even. It's not even, you know, probably inconvenient, very painful. Some of us have feet issues, so I understand it. But, He neglected to seek help later on. And so this struck me that even though this may be pretty elementary, my dear friends, um, the scripture is replete with a reminder that 
that the Lord will help you, and the Lord wants you to seek him for help. So he, he helped me and encouraged me to continue on with this message. We must seek the Lord's help. And so God is there to help for any reason. And I want to say this, I'd rather say it differently, that God is free to help for any reason. God is sovereign. He is not bound by any arbitrary law outside of himself. God is a free agent, and he will help whomever he will help and whenever he will help. And I think we see this in this passage. I imagine there were many axe heads that went missing all over the world when this event happened as well. Statistics kind of help us with that. But God chose to help this man at this time because he is sovereign. God can do whatever he wants with whatever he wants. And so thinking about this axe head flying off, assessing the situation, we kind of, it doesn't, it's hard in the context. There's a lot of vagueness in this context. So we want to ask some questions about this reason. Okay, why did God help him? Was it so that this man could continue in the work? Was that why God decided to break the laws of nature to recover this man's axe head? Was it so that the work can continue? Is it, is it that essential? I would say no, because why let it fly off in the first place? Well, maybe God can't do it because it's a mishap. It's outside of his control. If God can make the axe head float in the water, he can keep it on the stick. He can keep it on the handle pretty okay. Um, I don't think God performed this miracle so that the man could continue in his work. Was it so that he could fulfill his promise to return it? Okay, did the appeal that this was borrowed and I want to honor my friend and love my friend, my neighbor, is that why perhaps um, the Lord allowed for this miracle? Well, if that's the case, I would argue against it. Why let it fly off in the first place? I mean, it's kind of, we kind of have the same deal there. Um, was it so that man could know that there was a God in heaven that has the power to help man? I think this is more of the issue. I think what we find that this whole passage is not really about the guy. That's why he's unnamed. I think this passage is, this is a revelation. I mean, we think about Of all that we have in Scripture, God creating the heavens and the earth, the Lord Jesus Christ becomes incarnate. God, very God, enters into creation, suffers and dies and is resurrected. I mean, we have those amazing revelations. Why is this in here? What is this revealing about God? Why did this make it into the eternal Scriptures? Because it's about God, and it reveals something about God. So I think we're getting closer. I don't have an objection, as I was playing the advocate here. I don't have an objection for that perhaps it is so that we could know. The scriptures themselves, in Romans, he says that the latter, the former things were written so that by hope and encouragement we would have from the scriptures, we would press on. So what about this? Was it to show that when man sees that they're hindered by their limited frame, the limitless God can and will help? I think that's it too. I think this is all about God revealing his concern and his care. And I think it's to show his power, We take this for granted, but if this had happened to maybe a pagan nation, they got to consult the river god, especially for this. And man, if you're not on good terms with the river god, you're in trouble. You got to find somebody who is. Um, Or maybe you consult the god of iron or metal. I don't know. It's one god. He's demonstrating he's the god of the rivers. He's the god of the hills. He's the god of the oceans. He is the god of all things, and he has sovereign power over every realm and every creation. And I think it's supposed to show that God is a personal God. That again, God is aware of this insignificant situation and he wants to help man, even in this matter. So I have a little apologetic aside, we have time. Um, there's, There's a trend and there's been a move amongst people who want to claim that they're Christians who dislike um, the miraculous sections of the Bible. And perhaps, I mean, you talk to atheists and they'll flat out tell you, well, those are just untrue myths. Like, that didn't happen. The axe head did not float. Um, it's a scientific impossibility. Um, I don't really care much for them. But as far as any, well, you know what I mean. Um, I don't care much for their arguments. We care much for them. We love y'all very much if you're listening. But my concern is for people that want to claim to be Christian or maybe they're a deist, Um, And they want to say, look, there's a lot of great teachings in the Bible, but the hang-up is, this goes back to Matt's, there's a pragmatic problem. 
when you present this to someone, um, it gets laughed off as being impossible, or perhaps it's, it's, um, it's just fantasy. It's just an untrue exaggeration of the story. That's not what it's about. And so there's people who are claimed to be Christians and say, oh, I follow Jesus' teachings, but I just don't believe in all the mystical stuff. Okay? Um, okay, so this is, again, apologetic aside. Let's, 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 try, let's see how that works with this story. What do you teach then from this segment? Let's cut out the miracle. What is this even about then? Is this a, a nice little story about how you should be a good steward of things that you borrow? I mean, does it become then, right? Are we going to talk about the, about the, uh, the, the benefits of knowing a trade? You can build your own home. These guys are self-made men. They're independent. It's not what it's about. Or, uh, I mean, what else? I mean, I don't even know becomes really dry and becomes this insipid kind of story. And I would, I think of Thomas, who was it? Thomas Jefferson did this, right? Was it Thomas Jefferson? Does anyone know? Yeah, he had what? His four gospels. Oh, this is a great, it's an amazing thing. But I want to get rid of all this supernatural bit, all the miracle bit. It's really bothersome, okay? And so he edited and copied and came out with with the four gospels without the miracles. Has anyone read that? Has anyone like tried to read it? I mean, I imagine that's so disjointed. I don't know what you would do. I wanted to see if we can do that with this. Uh, okay, so let's, let's see if we can cut this miracle out. And then the man of God said, where did it fall? And then he said, I'm mean, like, where would you stop? Alas, my master, it was borrowed. That's a good stopping point. But if we're going to be true to that kind of style, we're just going to exit, you know, cross out the miracle. Let's see how that reads. Then the man of God said, where did it fall? When he showed him the place, he cut off a stick and threw it in there. That's where you got to stop. I just want y'all to see. It's the end. <laughs> what do you do with that? What do you do with that? Christians, when we come across these miracles in the Bible and they want to bring up, bring up perhaps how hard it is to believe in such a thing, what they really have a hard time with is they have a hard time in submitting to the, revela- the true revelation of God, that he is sovereign over his creation, that he is indeed the God who rules in heaven and earth. The reason why they hate God's miracles, albeit if they were pressed to and they needed it, they would, they would cry out for one. But when they see a miracle far away from them, or they see Jesus perform a miracle, they hate God and therefore they don't want to see that he has authority to invade what they want to claim is their realm. The secular humanist or the man who wants to be the naturalist avoid and avoid all manner of spirituality and God altogether does not want to see God invade in the realm that they're seeking to take dominion over. And it's amazing how heartless that is. I mean, imagine what you take away God's ability to help man in this spectacular fashion. What are you going to say to the Shunammite woman? Well, too bad. There's no point in going to the prophet. There's no God that's going to help you. They would rather her son stay dead. When Thomas Jefferson wants to remove the miracles of the Lord Jesus Christ, he would like to see everyone that was healed still suffer in their illness than let God be God. It's a very strange thing, but you see this manifest. After Lazarus is resurrected, the Lord Jesus Christ miraculously resurrects them. The Pharisees hated that revelation of God so much that they wanted to kill Lazarus so they won't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's probably not an issue here, um, but I want to give you a little apologetic ammo for if you encounter someone who, who wants to avoid the miraculous works of God, point out to them that the miraculous works of God are there to the benefit of man. They greatly benefit us. We're greatly benefited by God interfering I don't know where I am. I went far off the notes. Okay. So, guess we'll conclude. Psalm 147. We all go there.
Psalm 147, verse 10 and 11. Maybe we'll go up to seven. We have time for the whole thing. It says, Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make melody to our God on the lyre. He covers the heavens with clouds. He prepares rain for the earth. He makes grass grow on the hills. He gives to the beasts their food and to the young ravens that cry. His delight is not in the strength of the horse, nor his pleasure in the legs of man. But the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him and those who hope in his steadfast love. That's God's mercy upon creation. God shows he helps all his creation. And here it is, that question, what does the Lord take pleasure in? Believe it or not, fallen men and women, that the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him and those who hope in his steadfast love. Those who are hoping for the help of God, for the love of God that would come in and raise them up, like the axe head, that God would raise men up and to make them useful once more. So we don't know exactly why God chose to perform the miracle for the man from the context alone. It doesn't really tell us. I have no idea why Elisha threw a stick. Maybe it's because Elisha's connecting this miracle with the, to let know that the same God who healed the waters of Meribah, when Moses threw the stick into the bitter water, it was healed. Maybe there's a connection there. Context does not help us much with the stick. It may be to confound the people who want to edit the Bible. I'm not sure. We don't know if ultimately the man's strong desire to return what was borrowed moved God in order to, in order to perform this miracle. But here's what we do know for sure from this context. After this miracle has been performed, after God is sought for help and God chooses to help man, he was able to return the axe head. He was able to continue in his work and be useful. He was able to better understand God's power and love. He had a witness now, a testimony to share with anyone who asks. I mean, you got the axe head. You can go and show everyone The Lord made this float in the River Jordan when it was impossible to reach. What a testimony. What a nice and easy testimony that is. And he was better able to comprehend God's personal care and love through this act. The man, the one miracle, this minor miracle, accomplished so much. And, you know, I wouldn't, it took me a while to realize what all happened after after this little event. And I think Elisha only did so many miracles. He did, what, twice as many as as Elijah did. But if I knew, okay, you have, what, 14 miracles to perform, I'm going to wait for the big thing. (laughs) I'm not going to waste it now if you only had so many to cash in. Um, Doesn't work that way, but just thinking. I wouldn't have have spent one here. But uh, he has, the people all surrounding there have a better understanding of God's personality, his character, his attributes, and his power, right? We do too. I mean, it's recorded, beloved, for us. It's recorded that we might have a hope and a consolation. I wrote out the scripture. Yeah, I skipped a lot of my notes. Romans 15.4, for whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we may have hope. I mean, it was written for us as well as for them. What a thought. What a thought. This miracle has accomplished all these things and much more. So, then let me ask you this. What could be said of the greatest miracles that happened 2,000 years ago? If God can accomplish so much revelation and so much hope and encouragement through this one event, beloved, what about God becoming flesh. What about the incarnation, the Son of God taking on human flesh? And then the grand and glorious exchange that God would take our sins upon himself in the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. He bore our sins in his body on the tree. And then the great and glorious miracle following after his vicarious death, the great miracle of resurrection. The Lord 
the Lord has done an amazing work upon the earth. And the results are as follows. It's the same thing. Now, after being resurrected, I mean you as an individual, if you have believed and put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, you've had a personal miracle by the personal God done to you. The Lord saw you, saw that you were in need of help, and he has caused you to be born again. But much more than an accident coming out of the water, your very life, your very soul, your very being, and your very nature are now restored to their proper place and proper function. You now can, can work and serve the Lord, for we are his workmanship. Beloved, you now can bring a hope and consolation to others. Think of Paul and his conversion, the great and glorious miracle. He sees the Lord Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. He's blinded, miraculously converted, given new life. And then at some point, some Macedonians cry out to him, come, to, come and help us. It's that cry for help. And the Lord now sends you, Christian. You are his living miracle, the living result. You now, being the object of a past miracle done to you, now are his work and his help to a needy world. And I guess I just want us to think about that we, these, God spins these miracles for a purpose. God has displayed and revealed these things for a very purpose. We're coming up in Ephesians. Jason's going to preach on all that we can now accomplish because this wonderful miracle of the incarnation and resurrection and our new birth has been accomplished for us. So let's pray. Let's pray to the God for help, the God who can help, the God who desires to help. Let's pray to him that he would help us, not only with the great and awesome things that are worthy of his attention, still they'd be a small thing in his sight, but every little thing, and let us be humbled knowing that as Jesus said, apart from him, we can do nothing. Let's pray. Well, thank you, Lord, for your revelation. Thank you for this story. Thank you for, um, thank you for the help you have given to man. Lord, even our memories are dull, and you have given us help, even that we could look, see, and taste certain things in order to remember your glorious work. You have given us, as we have had today, the communion, the bread, and the wine, that we should remember what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us. You've tied this miracle to the objects of an axe head and a stick. Lord, I can't help but ever see an axe and remember that you care for man and that you are the help of man and that you have power over this creation. Lord, now you've so tied this miracle together with these things that every time we see, I see my children throw a stick in the river, a stick in the creek, I wonder what's going to come up. You've so reminded us, God. You've helped us. You know our frame, and you have been so good to us, O oh God. I pray that we never forget such a thing, and that even to the very end of our lives, on our, on our very last, in our very last moments, we would look to you for the help we need for that day. Amen.